morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike Noggle, pastor here at Pleasant View United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to our joint virtual service with our sister church, uh, Mount Cor United Methodist Church, for our time together this morning. I want to also thank all of you who are joining us online, uh, and uh, we are glad that you have signed in. I don't have a lot of announcements for you this morning. We're in the middle of our partial reopening, as uh, was indicated. Uh, you do have uh, uh, the right to be present here in the congregation. Uh, we encourage masks, uh, well, we uh, in demand masks over the nose and mouth. We're socially distanced, scattered around the sanctuary. We encourage the use of gloves. That way you don't have to be worried about touching anything or anybody uh, cleaning up afterwards and so on and so forth. So uh, that makes it easier for us to do. Just uh, we will continue on this and see how that goes. I know we have about uh, 12 people here in the congregation uh, this morning uh, joining us live. So uh, that's always uh, nice to see at least eyes. I can't see anything else, but I at least see all your eyes and that's nice. Uh, so um, uh, we uh, will be getting information out to you as that changes, as circumstances changes. But uh, certainly for those who feel uh, who are members of these churches who uh, do not feel comfortable coming. We will be continuing the online service even after we're fully back reopened completely uh, for uh, those of you who cannot uh, be here uh, presently. And uh, the only real announcement that I have this morning is that uh, the Pleasant View Administrative Council is coming up uh, with the meeting on Tuesday, uh, January 26th at 7 p.m., we will get you information uh, shortly about whether that's going to be uh, a Zoom meeting or whether it'll be in person. I, I imagine it will probably be a Zoom meeting yet, uh, but we will get that information out to you by email uh, for those of you who are on council. Do we have any other announcements that we need to make this morning? I just uh, want to uh, point out that this past uh, Wednesday, the 13th, Brian Lickley had a birthday. And uh, the 14th, Jeff Crawford and Sally Green. The 15th, Kennedy Holiday. I don't know if she's watching, if she is. Happy birthday. But Kennedy Holiday had a birthday on uh, Friday. And yesterday, Sue Koontz had a birthday. Uh, so if you know any of those or see any of those, wish them happy birthday. And with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Robin to begin our service.
Thank you, Robin. It's time for prayer requests, and I want to share some of them with you that I know of, and then we'll open it up for any of you that may have others that we need to add on. Obviously, uh, we have been praying for Mike McDowell, Robin's husband, and we continue to pray for him. He did get home on Friday uh, and is, uh, is still uh, struggling to, uh, to get uh, back on his feet to, to some degree. Uh, medication and so on still have him pretty groggy. Uh, so uh, we're hoping that uh, time uh, will allow his lungs to heal to the point where he can uh, regain some function again. Also, uh, T.C. Clevitz did have a surgery on his back this past week. It went well. He is home and recovering. Uh, it will be a long process, uh, so he'll need uh, prayers for some time. I also know that Kenzie Welsh has been having uh, some uh, renewed problems with her knee. She had just gotten to the point where she could put some, uh, some weight back on her leg again and, and was uh, in a lot of pain and went back and now they're thinking there may be some other issues unrelated to what she had before or at least that was not dealt with when uh, the other was dealt with. So we need to remember Kenzie uh, and her family as she goes through uh, this uh, process uh, with her leg. We also uh, have a lot of prayers for our country that we need to be lifted up. Uh, this week in particular, prayers for the outgoing president and his family, the incoming president and his family, the safety of the uh, people and uh, those that are attending the inauguration and uh, any protests that might be out there that they remain peaceful and that uh, the uh, continuing work on distribution of the vaccines uh, regarding this uh, COVID pandemic uh, uh, get uh, done efficiently and uh, quickly so that uh, our lives can return to some semblance of normal uh, would be nice, whatever normal is going to be from here on out. Um, so are there any other uh, prayer requests? Uh, yes, Regina. Our grandson, Cooper. Took a knee to the nose yesterday at a wrestling meet that wasn't pretty as mom said and it split his lip and his i don't know they don't know if it's broke or not so they're gonna wait a couple days and see what happens okay for those who might not have been able to hear uh ed and regina's grandson cooper's a wrestler and it had a little mishap during the match with uh, banged up his nose and lip pretty good so we'll keep them in prayers uh nancy we need to remember the family of uh, Patty Collins. Many of us remember her as a longtime religious education teacher in Hancock County. She passed away this past week. And Nancy Thomas is asking for prayers for the family of Patty Collins. Uh, many of you, uh, some of you at home, uh, maybe have. Uh, remembered her as a religious education teacher for many years in this area and she recently passed away i think she she had battled cancer is that correct and she had a, a variety of health issues and the different different things that were going on and she recently passed away so remember her family are there other prayer requests that we need to lift up other than what we've already mentioned okay let's go to the lord in prayer Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your building. It feels so good to be able, for those who feel safe, to be able to do so, uh, taking the precautions necessary. But we just are so grateful to be able to be here. We also understand that no matter where we're at, whether we're at home watching, whether we are uh, uh, listening at another date and time, that we know that you are with us always in every circumstance, in every uh, situation. We also know that you are God who answers prayers and you know the needs uh, of all of us before we even ask them. We have many people that are listed on our prayer list uh, during uh, in our newsletter and we know that you are with them as we continue to pray for them and you know the situation and will address them as you see fit. We also this morning want to lift up specifically uh, Mike McDowell as he uh, continues to struggle but now at least at home in his own bed and we just 
asking you to continue to strengthen him and, and give strength to Robin as she continues to nurse him and, and, and help him. Uh, we thank you for the uh, successful surgery uh, that TC Clevidence went through this past week. We ask your continued healing uh, that that process uh, be as swift and as complete and as painless as possible and that uh, you restore him to vigor and health once again. Be also with Kenzie Welch as she uh, goes through uh, this struggle with uh, her leg and be able to get back on her feet and be back to being the active young lady that she has uh, always been. And we just ask that you give the doctors wisdom uh, to help them uh, help her. Lord, we w wish to uh, also lift up uh, Cooper, Ed and Regina Houston's grandson as he uh, deals with this injury of his nose and, and his lip. And as he uh, recovers from that, help uh, him um, get through that and, and relieve his pain. And also be with the family of Patty Collins this morning as they uh, grieve the loss of someone very special to them. Uh, many people here know, knew her and uh, appreciated all that she did for uh, the kingdom of God. And we just ask that you to bless them and give them comfort and peace at this difficult time. <clears throat> Lord, this is a time of transition in this country. This country needs a lot of prayers in many ways, but particularly this, this week, we lift up uh, the current president and his family. Uh, we ask you to... Uh, Give them some uh, peace and comfort and guide and direct them as they uh, go into retirement and leave office. We ask that you be with the incoming president and his family, that you uh, protect them, uh, give them strength, give them wisdom to follow you and what you would ask them to do. And be with this country as we go through this uh, inauguration uh, ceremony that uh, everybody would be safe that any protests be peaceful, and that we all start looking uh, to you for healing and reunification, because it's only under your guidance and leadership that that will happen. We also ask for prayers for this pandemic, as we have done regularly over the last 10 and 11 months. We just ask that the uh, vaccines that uh, have been produced are safe and are uh, helpful and are able to uh, protect those who receive it. We ask a wisdom for those who are in the process of making decisions on how to distribute it, uh, help it uh, return this country and, and the world back to some uh, semblance of normal. Uh, and we ask uh, you to be with those who are continuing to struggle uh, with a diagnosis of COVID and to those uh, families uh, be comforted for those who have lost loved ones during this period of time. We know that there may be other requests that uh, are on the minds of those in this congregation or those who are watching online, and we uh, just uh, take this moment to lift those up to you as well. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given each one of us and the faithfulness of these two congregations to give a part of that back to your service. We ask that you to bless the offerings that come in uh, to uh, both of these churches, uh, to use them, to multiply them, and help us uh, to make an impact uh, with them for you in this community and beyond. And we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ whose sacrifice and unconditional love has made eternity possible for all of us. And we just uh, praise you for that gift, so freely given, so undeserved, but yet available to each and every one of us. And we now pray the prayer that that son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
I don't know if you have minded though, but over the last uh, uh, few months or so, we have been uh, delivering the message uh, out away from the pulpit uh, to get a little bit closer, not only to those of you who are uh, feel comfortable enough to come into the sanctuary, but those who are watching online. Um, uh, eventually we will get back there, but uh, at least for now, I, I think it uh, makes it a little bit more personal if I'm out here a little closer to you and not have that separation of that piece of furniture between us as we, we talk here this morning. Our scripture verses this morning come from the New Testament, the uh, first, uh, first Peter, uh, the first chapter, verses 13 through 25. And Simon Peter says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. He has chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another, deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Folks, as we begin our message this morning, which I've titled, Where is the Hope? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever stopped to think of all the emotions that are conjured up when you think of something being new? We are currently at the beginning of a new year. In some years, that also means the beginning of a new decade or a new century. Life itself brings us our share of new things. Maybe it's a new school year or even a new uh, school. What about a new job? And one's life has its milestones, a new marriage or relationship, a new birth. For someone who has just gotten out of prison or someone who gives the, up their past and turns their life over to Christ, uh, in both of these cases, we talk about that person is given a new life. Sometimes new things in our lives are material possessions, a new home, a new car, a new hobby or interest. Of course, for those of us who are sports fans, the beginning of a new season always brings out a lot of emotions. And one of the topics that you are never supposed to discuss at family gatherings is politics, the other being religion, of course. And this week ahead will bring us a new administration, a new government, new policies, new programs. The common denominator in all of these new things is that it stirs up our emotions and many of which might be conflicting. We try to navigate these feelings of anxiety versus expectation, the feelings of nervousness or fear versus excitement and hope. 
And of course, most of us are familiar with the famous verse in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 13, in which he sta states that these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I do not disagree that love is the greatest of these. God is loved, and the gift of his Son to come and be our Lord and Savior is the greatest act of love ever known in all of human history. But I also submit to you that one of the human emotions that runs deep to the core and has an enormous impact on our emotional and mental well-being is the emotion of hope. Webster's Dictionary defines hope as a desire of some good with the belief that it is attainable. Trust. One in whom trust and confidence is placed. When used as a verb, to hope is to have a desire with some expectation of attainment. And as we enter a year, a decade, a century, there's always an expectation that there very well may be some good things ahead. We enter into marriage or look at a new uh, baby born with an expectation that there are some wondrous experiences that life will bring to us. It is said in baseball that hope springs eternal, meaning that every spring as a team begins preparations for a new season, there is the possibility that this could just be the year when the dreams of a championship are fulfilled. And those expectations exist in all sports. And we expect that a new job or a new school, a new home, a new car will provide us some level of enjoyment and satisfaction. What about that part of the de definition of those expectations being attainable? What is that based upon? Well, those expectations are based upon life experiences and observe, observations of things that have happened in the past. Because we have seen people thrive in a new job, a team thrive in a new season, a family fill and enjoy uh, the benefits of a new home, we can see that it is possible that experiences, those experiences will be ours as well. There is a belief that good will ultimately triumph over evil, that courage will conquer over fear. Maybe you or a family member have been confronted with a serious or potentially fatal diagnosis. We cling to the hope that medical science has provided the techniques, the doctors, the medications, the procedures that will result in a recovery from the disease. And that belief, that hope is heightened by the experiences of other patients who have been in that position and have likewise recovered. An understanding of the impact of hope on us as human beings might be even more wide, vividly seen when hope is gone. You will see this when the, that same medical diagnosis includes doctors telling us that there is nothing more that can be done. And even at that point, we naturally will cling to some hope, any level of hope, that there might be an experimental treatment, a miraculous recovery through prayer, uh, in a second opinion from a different medical provider that may be aware of something that the pre previous provider was not. Hope can be present even in the tiniest possibility of a positive outcome. But what happens to a person's will to fight the disease and live when that hope is extinguished and it's clear that a different outcome is going to happen? What happens to a person who's been married to someone for 60 or 70 years and loses their spouse? Very often the survivor cannot grasp life without their partner and without any hope for good things to come gives up their will to live as well. What about the person who is born and raised in abject poverty, lives their entire life in deprived conditions and sees all those around them having the same experience? What hope does that person have 
that life will ever get any better. Often we as humans uh, begin looking into the future with hope, find our desires based upon things that are beyond our control, and then are left devastated and hopeless when something happens to snuff out the hope that we had. A fire, a flood, a tornado destroys our home and all of our possessions. An accident results in our vehicle being totaled. Season-ending injuries occur to key members of your sports team, leaving the prospects of a successful season in a pile of ashes. Our spouse is found to be unfaithful or dies or is killed, destroying the lifetime of marriage that was envisioned at the beginning. A beautiful child brought into the world and was so sweet and innocent becomes addicted to drugs and alcohol and they are unable to overcome the demons facing them. A politician or a political party promises something that you place your hope in and only to find out that they end up doing something different, that they were wrong, or that they never really meant what they said in the first place. You pick up and move your family to an entirely different town to take on this new job, only to go within months, uh, to be let go within months of starting. It is clear that where we put our hope is critical because hope can be dashed by events and circumstances not of our own choosing. And then what? Some might be looking around today and see little to be hopeful about. Things haven't gone the way we hoped and the world around us seems to be crumbling or becoming something that we, did not, we do not recognize or want. Some of you will recall a man by the name of uh, Charles or Chuck Colson. He actually was a legal assistant in the administration of Richard Nixon, who got himself wrapped up in the scandals which befell that administration, ended up doing seven months in a federal prison for obstruction of justice. But during that time, he became convicted, not only of his legal failings, but also of his personal failings, and turned his life over to Christ in 1973. And for the rest of his life until 2012, when he passed away, Chuck Colson became an articulate defender of the faith, prolific writer of Christian books, and pro uh, founded the Prison Fellowship International to help change the lives of those who are incarcerated. During one of his speeches, he asked the question, where is the hope? Where is the hope? I meet millions who tell me that they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? Well, before the birth of Jesus, the Jewish people could very well have been asking that same question, where is the hope? The prophets that had advised them and revealed to them what God was telling them had been silent for over 400 years. They were constantly oppressed by foreign powers. They knew that God had threatened to hide his face from them if they did not repent of their wicked ways. And indeed, a dark shadow had fallen across the planet. So they waited and wondered. Hundreds of years earlier, the great Jewish King David in one of his Psalms, Psalm 74, 9 and 10, actually wrote of the feelings that they were experiencing centuries later. He wrote, We are given no miraculous signs, no prophets are left, and none of us knows how long this will be. How long will the enemy mock you, O God? The Jews of Jesus' day, and many of us Christians today, may be feeling the same way that David did. The Jewish people waited and wondered, but they had one flicker of hope. The ancient promise of a coming Messiah who would come to save. And on this promise, Jews staked everything. What about today? 
Today, we as Christians find ourselves in a similar situation, do we not? We were told that Christ would come again. We have no idea how long it will be. We question just how long God will be mocked and belittled and dismissed by the people whom he himself created. So we wait and wonder. But we have that one flicker of hope. Christ will come again and will set everything right. And on that promise, we Christians have staked everything. We have an eyewitness to testify us for us, however. Simon Peter, the rock. Christ's chosen one, who was by the Savior's side, who heard and seen everything, wrote to those who were suffering for their faith in Christ in his time and in today. First Peter was written to strangers, Christ's followers scattered around the world. It is a letter that can be addressed to us. Chapter 1, verses 13 to 25, as I, wrote, as I read earlier, were the words of assurance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Because you were purchased, not of perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and defect. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. You see, part of the definition of hope, if you'll recall, was an expectation that the desire would be attained and that we often base that expectation on what we have seen and experienced. God has for millennia exhibited time and time again how he can be trusted to keep his promises and how he constantly is working for the good of his children. Scripture is replete with examples and reasons to put our hope and trust in God. In Psalm 42, uh, verse 11 and 43, verse 5, David uh, says this, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 40, verses 31, why we should put our trust and faith in God. He said, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And the Apostle Paul, likewise, writing in his first letter to Timothy, his protege, told him, put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Chuck Colson, in his speech that I referenced earlier, gave the answer to the question he asked, where is the hope? He said, the hope that each of us has is not in who governs us, or what laws are passed, or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of his people, and that's where our hope is in this country, and that's where our hope is in life. One of the great old hymns of the church written by a clergyman in England in 1834 states confidently that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. His oath, his covenant, his blood, supports me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and sway on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand 
Friends, maybe the real question for us this morning is not where is the hope, but in what or in whom are you putting your hope? It is my prayer this morning that we all learn to put our hope and trust in the one who created us, the one who loves us, and the one who has shown he is worthy of such hope and trust, and that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being so constant, being so faithful, being so trustworthy. We know that when all circumstances around us seem bleak, we know that we can put our hope and trust in you and you will never disappoint. Because ultimately our goal is to be with you in person and spirit, to spend eternity with you, and you have so graciously provided a way for us through the sacrifice of your son Jesus, through that precious blood, that was spilled on our behalf, something that we could not earn, something we do not deserve, but something that you gave freely to everyone who calls upon your name. Give us the strength and courage to face whatever fears, whatever circumstances surround us, and keep our eyes laser focused on you, the source of our hope. In Jesus' name. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>